What's up traders? This is Tosh. I go by T Bradley 90 in the My Investing Club chat. Today we have a very special and new video for you guys. One of our head moderators in MIC, Austin, who goes by Aloha Trader in chat, who is both long and short biased, has started a weekly Thursday two hour QA webinar for members. He talks about MIC strategies and also takes members' questions live. While this is just a sample of the entire two hour webinar, if you want to see the full length version or any of our exclusive content, then become an exclusive MIC member. Alex did a good job of um, reorganizing the video website and the MIC strategies are the ones that I want to go over in this webinar. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go over important trades I made, recapped or not. And every week I'm going to be doing this, like there's going to be different segments of this webinar, like some of the segments, my, my important trades is going to be a segment. Market sentiment is going to be a segment. Key topics is going to be a segment. I'm going to have a watch list seg segment. You know, I might have like a one-on-one -on -one invitation in the future where I invite members on um, where like we talk about their trades. That might be a segment. So there's going to be different segments week to week. So hoping that we can get, um, hoping that if we can switch it up every single week and go over different facets of trading, there might be a psychology segment one week. So, and then we're always going to end with the question and answer segment, what this is all about. Bao was long this, Bao was long biased on this um, pre-market and so was I. And what was, what was really um, the, the, the conflict here was that we know it's a pig, we know it's a piggy company, but because the, it's got that beyond, that beyond IPO sympathy to it, um, it had that that kind of hype factor for that sympathy momentum that we always see in the market. Another important trade. This one was today. Um, uh, workout uh, workhorse workout workhorse. Yeah, and so this was a really conflicting trade, where um, because there was two things weighing on my mind. The move is too big. You know, we had it got up to five pre market, right? Like the move was definitely too big for, um, for a float this size. I think the float was like 40 or 50 million, right? Like this was a, this was a massive float and it was, um, what I consider to be unsustainable for, um, the float. Meaning like if, if, if something was up that much, like when, when we're up from like one, um, I'm thinking that it, we're immediately going to sell right out of the gate. Like, because it, there's just going to be an overwhelming, um, flood of supply. Um, so yeah, market sentiment. I just wanted to kind of go over. I want to do this week to week. Um, we're just coming off of earnings season. And for those who don't know, earnings season happens four times a year. Um, it, it, it happens in April, I think April, July, um, April, July, October, and, uh, January. And this is because, um, it's quarterly, right? Quarterly earnings and January, January, February, March, um, normally they come out a month later in, in April and then, you know, like, um, April, May, June, and then the next month is July. So that's why you get them. They typically last about four weeks. And so we're coming off of earnings season. So, um, this is kind of explains why it's been really dead lately. And, you know, if, if you guys have been, um, avoiding the boredom trades, really good job, everybody, because it's been really tough. Like I've, I've actually not been doing the greatest. I've been trading UBXY, but I've been trading it really small. I'm experimenting is my excuse. Five. Hey, Bao, Bao joined in. Um, what's up, Bao? Can everybody see Bao? Um, <laughs> what's up, buddy? Um, I'll put you right over there. Um, cool. So, um, where, where are we at here? Um, oh, this is the, the, the thanks guys. So one of my weaknesses, I say I enter a trade to long at 210 with a 250 goal in mind and the stock um, will range break through 220 from, from 210 to 230. Then it starts testing the previous resistance now support at say 220. And I sometimes let it go at 220 and it runs to 240 slash 250. Well, immediately before I even finish, I, I, I feel like that's, you changing your risk uh, um, without a valid reason to, right? Like that. this comes down to the thesis part. You gotta have a reason why you're in. Why did you long at 210? Was there some reason that the support was holding? Figure out where your thesis is. However, other times I hold for the exact goal and the 220 cracks 
and then say it goes to two and I'm out now because that was my previous risk. Um, I go from a green plus 20 to a minus 10 and this happens often. How would I approach? So um, this is probably an example of why did you get in right there at 210? There's probably a reason why you got in at 210, right? And that reason is probably because there, you thought that it was going to go up right away, right? You thought it was going to go up right away. And so you were right, right? You got, you got, um, you were rewarded, but you didn't take that. You didn't take the profit on your reward right there. Sometimes when you enter, there's two reasons to enter, right? And that means that you didn't, you're not paying yourself for being right part of the time. And you got to pay yourself when you're right on half of the trade, right? Uh, with the 250 is the, the, the goal in mind. But like what you're saying, but like to, to move your, your risk back up to 220, you have to realize that stocks like to play, right? Stocks like to test, right? Like they want to test that 220 level. Like they want to go over and under and make sure that like there's enough bidders, like people want to wait because a lot of people don't want to chase. They want to make sure that higher lows are going to happen before they get in. So that's why you see a lot of over and under stuff at, at like these levels that you're important that you deem important because most people deem important because support and resistance is kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy. So you want to kind of like, this is where like, I think your patience might need to um, increase a little bit. You need to stick to your, stick to your trade, stick to your process because um, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than getting out of a winning trade when you were right all along. It's going to, it's going to destroy your mental capital. You're going to go into the next trade and you're going to try and like, like I talked about at the beginning of the video, you're going to try and fix so that it, that doesn't happen next trade. And what you're doing is you, um, you're essentially uh, fixing something that's not broken, right? And that's, that's a problem that's gonna eat at your mental capital. Um, so yeah, and so that's why I say make small changes, right? Take some off for the profit right there. You know, take some of that profit off up there when you're immediately right. Don't, don't like just change completely and say, well, it didn't work this time. I got to change and take all of it off here or not stop out here or yes, stop, change my stop or no change my stop. You want to, um, you want to stick to that process, stick to that risk. But what you can do um, now, I, what I, what I don't want to give you the message of is if you are feeling uneasy about a trade, like I only, so I only um, deviate from my plan. If one thing happens if significant information that I did not expect to happen. So this is a trading rule that I have. It's, I, I do not deviate from my plan unless um, significant new information arises. Now this can be news pops up or I see something unexpected in price action. The second I see something unexpected, like a huge volume candle out of nowhere, I know that like there's something in the trade uh, that I don't know, right? There's something in the trade that that I did not foresee something is going on that I'm not sure of. That's the only time where I'm willing to like move my risk or change something or get out because um, there, there's something that I didn't foresee. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, eat baka. Uh, <laughs> uh, no one from Hawaii knows. Um, uh, what are you looking for in filings? So, uh, oh, great, great, Scott. Um, so what I'm looking for in filings is, is kind of what everyone else is looking for. I'm just looking for, I, I, if, so I want to know if I haven't uh, seen the company, I'm typically, I typically have a, every company's a pig and, um, until proven otherwise for the small caps and like, if, or the, the rule is if it's a pig before it's 100% likely still a pig now. So like if I'm trading SAEX, like I know the story there. Right. Um, but what I'm looking for is, 425s, I'm looking for shelves. Um, one, one thing I really like to do is take a look at um, operating cash flow. That really helps me to know um, if, if they're making money or not, right? That's one of the key metrics I like to look at is the operating cash flow because this tells me if their business is actually making money. And this kind of gives me the piggy level indicator. If, they're, if their operating cash is negative, that means that they can't sustain themselves through um, operating and that they, that they have to use financing. So this is kind of my piggy indicator is the operating cash flow in, in addition to looking at cash balance and seeing if they need cash and, and if it coincides with the story of there being a raise, right? If, or sorry, there being a shelf in there and that a raise can be there. Like that might give me some kind of indication to like this. It might, and it, it doesn't mean that I still might not long the stock, but it, it, you know, like if, cause I'm a momentum buyer, if I see momentum, I'm going to buy it, but it might make me more conservative on myself, right? That's what, that's what it might change. It might change the um, 
the way I, the way I trade it. Maybe I'm more conservative with my entries too. Maybe I don't go and buy that break because I'm afraid it's going to stuff into dilution, right? Or I might not long it at all. So that, those are the main things I'm looking for. I'm looking for cash on hand. I'm looking to see if it's a piggy. I'm looking to see, you know, high debt's always good. Um, I want to see um, if they've been profitable before or if they've just continually been not profitable. I want to see dilute at the markets are good. Shelves are good for shorts, for shorts, um, and, and for confirming a piggy and operating cash flow. Um, yeah, every girl I talk to, <laughs> uh, he's on the bar doing his thing. Oh, uh, thanks, Austin. Well, thank you. Um, no, thanks, Alex. Um, uh, under what circumstances, um, uh, under what circumstances you use market orders to get in and out of trade? I don't think I've ever used a market order in my life. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I do have a panic button and it is, um, an ARCA market. And I, I think the only circumstances I would ever do like is if I need to get out all of my positions and it's, I need to get out all of my positions right away. Like I think like I'm going to lose power or something like that's about the only time I don't use market orders at all. I, I'm never, and I'm never really worried about like not getting the fill because um, what you can all like, if you put a limit order, um, depending on how thin the stock is, I guess, but for most stocks, like if you put a limit order five cents above the price, you're probably going to get out all of your position unless you're trading like 20,000 shares or something like that, you know, um, and it's a thin stock, but you can always like, I much prefer to not give them a blank check. Um, because like you can totally, you totally like, I have that fear of like, I don't know, I can only assume, but like, I have that fear that you're going to just, they're just going to see that market order and you're just going to get a shitty fill when, you know, they're, they're the market makers are, are, they're in the business of making money. So they want to take the best offer and the best bid. So if the, if the ask is at $2 and you put an order at 205, they're, you know, they're going to take it, right? Like you're probably going to get out no more. You're, you're probably going to get out. So, um, I much prefer using out of the, or out of the market or in the, in the market limit orders, if that's the right way to say that. Um, Joe Kelly's let is exactly what I'm talking. Yeah, exactly. Um, to the T. I actually watched it today. Um, yes. Um, yeah, great info. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Marketable. Yeah. Basically, I mean, if you if you put a limit order way above the price, you're you're gonna get filled. Like. Um. So well, hey, that's only been an hour and twenty. I talked really really fast. Um. Are there any more questions? Like anything else we want to go over? I I I I was totally talking a little fast. I I I actually drank coffee before this. Oh man, Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith, man, because of that, because of the Anakin and Obi-Wan fight. Definitely, dude. Definitely. Slow down next time. Yeah. My I see, I don't really hate Jar Jar Binks. Like, I'm not like, he, he, I know he was caught comedic relief, but at least they made him play a role. Like he was the reason why Palpatine, you know, he, he, his foolishness is what put Palpatine in power. So at least he had a story arc. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was really fast. I, um, maybe I'll make a bigger, make a bigger PowerPoint next time. But I just, the first one, I just wanted to go over the classics. So as a long bias trader, can you briefly describe the process as far as getting locates for shorts? Like, what do you have to say? What do you have to say to say I need locates to short today? So um, I have a rule of thumb where uh, I, I don't like to locate unless I'm willing to put a starter position on at the time. Now this is for B setups only. Like if it's a B setup, I'm only willing to locate if I'm, if the price currently right now, I'm willing to put at least up my foot in the water, at least get my toes wet, right? Now, if it's a potent, even if it's a potential A setup, if it's a potential A setup, I'm locating pre-market at the, at whenever I can, because you have to, you, de you definitely have to, because it's, um, 
uh, it's an A setup. It's gonna like, even if you don't use it three times, you know, you don't get the opportunity to look at it three times, that fourth time is gonna pay for it if it's an A setup. Uh, you meant C. So did I answer that wrong? So as long as as a long bias trader, can you briefly describe the process as far as getting locates for shorts? So yeah, even though I'm a long bias, I still get shorts every single day. Uh, oh, no, actually, no, not anymore. Almost every like today, I located um, workhorse. I guess, but I did short it. Um, what do you have to see to say I need look? Yeah, I, that's it. Um, what would be your best advice to a new trader to become consistently profitable? Less is more, bro. Less is more. You do not need to trade every single day. In fact, like I hate the PDT. It's so un-American and it's such bullshit. Like I think like, I just don't think anyone should have the, the rule. No one should have the authority to tell you that. But um, in a, like, I guess the, the, the ins and out, the, if, if it's scalable, I think it would kind of fit, but um less is like you, you only need three trades a week, like two trades. Sometimes I, sometimes like I I've had profitable weeks where I only trade two times a week and unprofitable weeks where I trade every day, right? More trading doesn't mean more profits. Um, yeah. So it's, it's literally just hone in on that hone in on the, um, on, on, on just one thing that you're good at or two things that you're good at. And just, if you don't trade for a week, that's okay. Like, um, it's better than like a zero day is better than a red day. Uh, PDD sucks, but I bet it really, but I bet it saves a lot of people. Yeah. It, yep. Yep. Um, true that for a first, for a first bounce, once the price has spiked, created friends and then spiked more, are you immediately putting your scale in buy orders and scale in buy orders and stop limit risk and profits. So ideally if it's created friends and spiked, oh, okay. So yeah. So once it's created the friend and it keeps spiking. And so I know where I want to put the order. Is that, that's what you're saying. And am I immediately putting the orders in? Um, uh, no. And let me tell you why, because what if it like keeps going up higher than I think, you know what I'm saying? What if it keeps going up higher than I think? Like, I, I kind of want to see the top kind of happen first because the orders might not even be relevant. Like, what if it just goes way past the friends? You know what I'm saying? And, and then, the be, like, sometimes like, it can be a true parabolic where the, the first bounce is going to be where the friends isn't even at, right? So, but most of the time, it's going to be. So, I, I just wait because um, uh, normally you're on the front side. Like, what if what if you put the orders in and like news comes out like an offering or something like and then you get filled or something I don't know like I typically just wait until it's starting to tank because I want to see how it rejects what if it stuffs on like what if it stuffs on like a million share volume candle I might not want to buy that first bounce right I might not want to buy that first bounce if it stuffs on like a million share volume candle I might just say you know what? this is the first bounce that I'm skipping so I won't do that I, I typically wait to see how the top formed who's my favorite game of thrones character um for multiple for more reasons than one are you <laughs> um yeah team john Snow. yeah uh, he totally deserves a throne dude in my opinion oh man Good questions, guys. Good, good, good stuff. Yeah, man. Hey, good luck, guys. Thanks, Sam. No silly questions unless it's Googleable. I know this might be a silly question, but are you more profitable longing or shorting? Gosh, you know, that's a tough one, dude. I, I, I haven't tracked in a while, but like, um, I think still... Um, it's probably about 50, 50 now. I, I honestly, I have, to, I have to do the math because I don't know shorting overall, because I definitely lost a lot while trying to learn how to long near, near late 2018. So overall shorting, definitely overall shorting, but I have high hopes for, um, longs in the future. Yeah, guys. Well, thanks. I mean, 30 minutes early, but like I said, I talked kind of fast.
for sure guys um and let, and please guys give me feedback um let me know uh let me know like what i can do to something else if you guys have an idea of something else that i can do um or do something better or or something please let me know like just send me pms um and and i'll and i'll take it to heart um we're gonna like i said like i'm gonna have different kind of segments of the show kind of like how uh, like i guess the jimmy fallon show he has like different segments i guess that's kind of how this webinar is going to be so hopefully like i don't know maybe we'll do a, something about psychology in the in the powerpoint next week Hey traders, this is Tosh. I go by T Bradley 90 in the My Investing Club chat. Just wanted to reach out and say if you have any questions about MIC, joining MIC, maybe you're a member already, you have three ways to contact myself personally and through MIC. You can hit our social media, you can hit me through PMs in chat, or you can contact us through my email at Tosh at myinvestingclub.com. That's T O S H at myinvestingclub.com. I will get back to you in a timely manner, and I'm saying this because I'm here to help, and I don't want anybody to be afraid to reach out and ask any question that they have. We are here for you guys. All right. See you guys.